I'm Joe Etling, Chair of the Vila County Democratic Central Committee. Welcome to Chat with the Chair. We're glad you could join us. A snowy evening in the Wabash Valley on an April day. Hard to believe, but uh, hope you're all staying safe, healthy, and warm today. A sad day uh, in uh, many ways, but uh, particularly the passing of Vice President Walter Mondale. Uh, we uh, uh, we're sad to hear that in the news uh, yesterday evening, and uh, we pass along our condolences to he, his family, and uh, we keep all of them in our prayers and thoughts, and and hopefully uh, gave you an opportunity to reflect on many of the accomplishments that he had in, in a very distinguished career of public service. And uh, so again, our thoughts and prayers are with the Mondale family. So if we can move on to our programming, though, this evening, we've got an excellent show again this evening full of great guests, and uh, we're going to get started here with our first guest. Well known to our viewers, I know, but go ahead and tell our viewers who you are. Uh, David Patterson, Executive Director of the Tarot Convention Visitors Bureau. David, we are delighted you could join us, and uh, I know that uh, you and I go way back, so uh, maybe you could though, share with our viewers a little bit about your background. Uh, well, born and raised in Terre Haute, I'm an ISU grad, uh, came through the ranks. Hey, you're moving, you move right through elementary school. We're, 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 <coughs> okay. on, we're, we're on, you know, your uh, Meadows, Wilson, North, and ISU. Okay, so we, we haven't had too many Meadows grads through here, mm -hmm. but uh, can we get the mascot for Meadows? Meadowlark. <clears throat> the Meadows Meadowlark, there we mm -hmm. go. We're big on the mascots. And then mm -hmm. I think we've had a few Wilson Warriors in here, and definitely some North Patriots. So we've got those, and uh, then a Sycamore. So... Uh, talk about uh, where it was you grew up in, in Terre Haute. Uh, well, my family lived in Holman Meadows, uh, just on the west side of, of Meadows School Elementary Field. And so, as you recall, we had, whether it was football or baseball or basketball, uh, there was always some kind of sporting contest between Edgewood Grove or Fruit Ridge Avenue and, uh, and Ohio Boulevard to, on 25th Street. So... Uh, you know, it was a wonderful time. I really, we had a lot of kids in those two areas, be it Edgewood Grove or, or Holman Meadows or that surrounding area around Wilson. And so there was always a game to be had. And, and uh, you know, it's a funny story. I really was one of the guys that would call everyone and say, hey, we're playing this here at this time. And, you know, and somehow I worked that into a job where I've been at for 26 years. So <laughs> this is, I recall those times uh, going way back many years ago and and we've had uh, various guests over the over the uh, past several months that have talked about some of those things and some and, and of course you've had uh, tremendous input with a uh, number of our uh, youth organizations here and they talked about that but that was more of almost like a sandlight sandlot type uh, activity so how's that different from what you've seen kind of going on today well, you know, safety is a big issue, and, and probably the most glaring example, I'm, I'm a big proponent of the Griffin Bike Park. I see great potential there for our community. But yet, as you know, when we were young, we rode bikes all over the streets of this community and, and never felt unsafe. Our parents, at least they never restricted me. Uh, so I'd play tennis at Collett Park, or I'd go down south the 8th in college and play basketball. Uh, but I think a big example is now, the streets are so busy and everything is such that now you have to provide a place for kids to have a safe bicycle riding environment. And so, you know, sadly, a tragedy kept this family on task, and, and I think they're creating a wonderful venue down there. So that's probably one specific example. Uh, you know, beyond that, I, I really don't know. I mean, I, you know, we never, we didn't have the video games and, and different things that the kids do now. Uh, so we were always outside playing something. You, know, you were quite an athlete, uh, and of course you, as you said, played all the sports, but then you you did develop a real specialty with tennis. So can you talk about what piqued your interest so much in tennis? You know, I can remember, uh, boy, one of the first nights I'd been playing baseball in the, the cinder-filled infield there at Woodrow Wilson, and so I was dirty and blood on my elbows and carrying my stuff home. And there were probably a hundred kids. And at that time, you know, you were dressed all in kind of the Wimbledon white clothing uh, under the lights. And, you know, I don't know. The girls were there. A lot of my buddies were, were having fun <laughs> playing sports. 
I kind of looked at that, and I had a sister that played, and uh, and then Bob Fisher, you know, with Bob this has just been wonderful, whether it's math, you know, tennis, chess, he just seems to have the Midas touch, and so I, I don't know, I developed lifelong friendships, uh, found love, everything, uh, really, tennis kind of paved my way, so. And you you uh, obviously were very accomplished as a young man, but then continued to play even as an adult. Yeah. It uh, it was fun. It, it uh, for years, you know, we would, would they were always beautiful venues, and we played a lot of places and spent a lot of years. But they were always kind of like mini vacations, and, and we helped. Helped, it helped when you win. I, but, well, we're talking about your win. <laughs> uh, our new basketball coach, Minnie State, was in last week, and and he was talking about uh, we were talking about his background in tennis, and he, when he was 14, second ranked in the country. Wow. Yeah. So that's. A, so we might need to get you with him. That you, is impressive. You all of a sudden, as you got older, got better. So, I yeah, mean, I'll tell you what. You're, you're, you're a world champion country. or something. Well, third. Right? We had a couple thirds in there. Is that right? Uh, yeah, the, and the amateur stuff. You got but, one of those uh, big belts or anything you wear around? Or no. <laughs> <laughs> no. Huh? Uh, no, you know what? The pinnacle of amateur tennis is actually a gold ball. Is that right? Uh, yeah. It's, it's not a real fancy trophy, but that is a, a symbol. Uh, Jamie, I believe, has seven. Is that right? Uh, pretty impressive. Any any time that you're in that top tier in amateurs or pros, that's a different level. So and did you push her more or did she push you more is what I want to know. Well, I think early on I probably pushed her more. As it went on, I think she carried the torch. Is that so, right? Yeah. So if, if we were out there uh, playing, not today, but on a given beautiful day out there, who's going to win that match? Age and injury, I'm, <laughs> sadly, I'm probably going to have to tip my cap most of the time. I'll get her every now and again, but it, it's few and far between. Uh, but we've had a lot of fun with it. it. It's something, you know, tennis you can play forever. Uh, so I've enjoyed it. it. It really, it's led me to a lot of friendships. Uh, and, you know, really, the same discipline you put in sports, you put in your job. Uh, so I don't know. I always saw a parallel between the two. That's great. And, uh, again, you brought a lot of, you and Jamie both brought a lot of attention back to, to Terre Haute and Beagle County with your tennis exploits and, of course, done a lot with regard to the tennis programs we'll talk about. So so talk about uh, what your career path has been to get to where you are today a little bit after you graduate from Indiana State. Yeah. Well, uh, I spent 11 years in the waste industry. Uh, the last, oh, I don't know five or six with Laidlaw, uh, uh, an international waste company. And then uh, this this job, the, the Convention Visitors Bureau, uh, they had asked me to step in in the summer of 95 and see the Farm Progress show through. And to be honest, I had no idea what I was getting myself into, but my son was five years old, and I, I kind of wanted to be around. And in fact, I can remember going and signing him up for T-ball and being disappointed that I wasn't going to be able to coach him. And so literally, like three days later, uh, a regional vice president, great big guy that played basketball at Memphis with old Keith Lee, a guy named Charlie Leonard, uh, was was in our office. And uh, Greg Gibson was, was an original CVB board member, and so he was there. And, uh, you know, I had no idea what was going down, but I knew it was something big, and so... I, I walked in and this guy was sitting with his legs crossed on my desk smoking a cigarette. And I, so I wasn't real thrilled at the moment, but, uh, but after I kind of looked at him, he said, come on, follow me. And, and they asked me if I would do it. And I, I just said, sure. They said they'd match my salary at the time. And, uh, so I, I did it mainly out of just wanting to be around my family to begin with. But, but as that summer unfolded, Dan Zerner was the, the committee chair at the time, and I still have a deep respect for Dan. Unbelievably organized and just a really smart fella. I, I really like him. And so as that summer unfolded, the Jarvis family hosted it, as you remember, and, yep. and I'm friends with all of them to this day. Uh, and so it was just, as that summer unfolded, I started seeing, you know, hey, we used to, you know, we had played in the Ohio Valley Regional at Val Field back in the day. That's something we could host. And so it kind of snowballed. And as that as that uh, Farm Progress show ended, <clears throat> I, I just I saw great potential in this. And so 
the county uh, accepted uniform tax legislation in 81. They had the office from 81 to 95. There were three directors. Uh, and, and the peak of their collections at, at those times were $262,000. Well, I'm proud that 25 years pre-COVID and 19, we'd collected $2.5 million. Uh, and so that set the stage for all this development and growth that we're seeing now. But it, it really has been a wonderful job. I mean, I suppose my influence, we've had a lot of sports. Uh, you know, coincidentally, John McNichols' vision of the cross-country course was unbelievable. I mean, for him to to see the potential in that, it, I don't know that he ever thought that it would grow. 50,000 people went through those gates in 2019. Um, it's our top draw. And and so, you know, I, I ran for other sports just to have the air, but I've developed a great, uh, you know, respect, I should say, for those that put that in. Because I can remember one gentleman that, that won the NCAA Division One crown one year, and he was sitting at the press table, and he was so tired. And, and the field of reporters were sitting there, and one of the guys kind of had a little bit of attitude in his tone. He said well, did you do anything special to prepare to win this thing? And the kid kind of popped up then, you know, and he said, well, I don't know if it's special, but he said, but I've been running 110 miles for six months. And when you stop and think about that, I mean, when you're going to school full time and you're running 110 miles a week, there's not much room for, you know, silly things. So uh, I don't know. It, it really, I, I, I would tell you year in, year out, the people involved, the, the competitors that come here, it's just amazing. Uh, we've had 13 Division I national championships, one Division Three, and then we'll have Division Three back in 2024. So, and a lot of other great things are in the wings of cross country. So do you recall much about at that time whether there was any kind of pushback about the project itself when that course was envisioned? You know, not really. I mean, I think you know, everybody was wondering where we were going to get the money and this and that. And yet we had humble beginnings. Uh, you know, our, as a young man, 24 years ago, my first job was pushing cars out of the mud to the gravel. I think uh, you're still doing that two years ago. <laughs> <laughs> well, we still occasionally do. But uh, but we've really improved the infrastructure and drainage and all those things. And so, you know, it... Uh, you know, we were the first in the country to build a purpose-built cross-country course, and so, you know, we really didn't have anything to gauge it by. Uh, it was John's vision. You know, thankfully, Greg was a runner, too, and then Coach Welch, uh, you know, his vast experience. Uh, you know, the, really, Vern Gibson gave the land, Bill and John. John had the vision for the course. Bill was kind of one of those guys that stayed out there every day and made sure – Everybody was on task. The guy on the the grader was doing the right thing and, and all those things. And so we really call those three the godfathers of cross country. Is that right? Uh, yeah. And so we have plaques that, that kind of note each of their, their their what they gave to the course and how it started. And what and, exactly did Greg do? Uh, <laughs> well, Greg convinced his grandfather that it was a great idea. Okay. Well, that, uh, give him credit and then, for that. And then, you know, he... He's always been a runner, and actually how the story went, his grandfather and father would travel around. He ran for Rose Holman back well, in the day. I, I know. And uh, so they would, you know, go over to Ohio, and they would literally see him for a fleeting second between the trees. I see. And so they realized that at some point, why can't you watch the whole race? I mean, this doesn't make sense. And so that's why we're a spectator-friendly course. Uh, there, You know, back then they had a, an old blue pickup. But they sat at the peak of the hill, and the the thought was that you could see that from wherever you were on everything below, so that would ensure that we'd always be spectator friendly. So it's really a neat story, and so the fact that that property has been a mine, a landfill, and now a cross country course, I don't know that you could find another piece of property that's had that kind of impact on this community. I, that's amazing, and, and the fact that he's still able to run is somewhat amazing. He he, is. His he, he clicks a little when he walks now, <laughs> that walks it? and runs, but yeah, he's still at it, boy. It, uh, uh, it amazes me that he can do it, Yeah, but he does it. Yeah. So the composition of that office then when you took it was is different than it is currently? 
somewhat. I mean, I, I knew when I came in, um, from 81 to 95, the tax rate, when it was implemented, it was at 2%. Well, when I came in in 95, I quickly learned the state average was 5%. So I knew we had to raise that. So that was my first uh, step at state legislation, and thankfully that went through well. I mean, you know, we aren't any different than any other community in this in this state. So I think everybody bought into that well. And that extra 3% is what really started us being able to invest back in our community. Uh, and so, you know, I, I'm proud to say we've had a lot of impact with, with various projects that, that we've done through the years. So. Absolutely. And of course, uh, you're, you're very visible in the, on television, newspaper, and, and such, but uh, your home, your office is, has changed location, is that right? Yes, for years it was 643 Wabash, right. and then, uh, wow, unbelievably, I think it's 11 years old, uh, out on 40, near 46 and Margaret, That's which... Hard to believe now will be strategically placed to the impending casino at some point. Uh, I think the fact, the vision was always such that we wanted something that you could see off the highway. And and we knew that, you know, as our community grows in the, in the decades to come, it's going to be east. And so to have that kind of strategically placed in the middle of all that, I think, again, you know, my board of directors, the councils, the, the commissioners through the years, I mean, that, it was a, a cumulative thought that, that that was the best place for that to be. And it was wonderful that the bank allowed that to, to be down there for so long, but really what prompted the move at the time uh, was a fire in that building. <laughs> so we had to go somewhere. Uh, so it moved up the process a little bit, but, uh, but now it, in my office is also the Indiana High School Track and Field Hall of Fame, uh, which is really a wonderful offering. If you've never seen that, it's unbelievable. The things they have from, you know, the early 1900s uh, to to date and, and noting those accomplishments. I want to say there's somewhere about 460 uh, inductees, and out of that are 42 Olympians wow. produced by the state of Indiana. And all are well showcased, and so it's a mix of... of Physical features, be it, you know, shoes that you can't imagine running in, kind of look like our old Rydell cleats yep. back in the day, or spikes, rather, yep. uh, to uh, some adaptive technology where you can, we have a, a lady that's volunteering, she's digitizing all the old uh, film from the IHSA state championships. Right. Probably have about 15 years done so far, but I've seen grown men come in in their late 70s and and cry because they've never seen themselves run. And so to see yourself winning a state championship for the first time in your life and you're yeah. 77 years old, it's pretty powerful. So it, it's really a neat offering, and I urge everybody to check that out if you haven't done so. So our viewers can, that's open to the public, our viewers can yes. come out there. And, and the address for your office is? 5353 East Market, Monday through Friday right now, 8 to 4. and. And as things change out there, I, you know, my hope someday is that it's open 24/7, seven days a week. So we'll see what the, what all is built out there and what happens. But, uh, but you know, that's probably the long-term thought that uh, we're going to continue to to grow this tourism Terre Haute to the point to where you know it, it's operating all the time. We could talk all day about all kinds of things, but I want to, I want, I do want to direct. Uh, some things you were kind enough to bring along, some photos I want to share with our viewers. And, and anybody that's been uh, in downtown Terre Haute has seen a lot of activity. And, boy, it's, it seems like it's happening quickly. Absolutely. So I, I don't know what you've done, but you've got people working, it seems like, around the clock down there. Darmong's done an excellent job, and all the subcontractors. I, I really think the community's going to be thrilled with this beautiful facility. It's going to be 41,000 square feet. We'll be able to see the 1,000 people for a dinner. Um, it will have multiple configurations, so we'll, we'll be able to adapt and, you know, have a number of groups in the same building, potentially on the same day. Uh, I, I really think it, it's going to be a wonderful offering. So my it's, viewers were hoping we put this up at the start so they didn't have to watch me probably all night here. But uh, <laughs> So those people who maybe have, have been in the quarantine for a year and don't know what's going on, mm -hmm. tell our viewers what's up on the screen there, David. Okay, that is the front face on Wabash Avenue. Uh, what is that building? That is the Terre Haute Convention Center. Very nice. Yes. Uh, 
really a beautiful building. Uh, very happy with it so far. Uh, and tell our viewers where that's situated on Wabash Avenue, again, if they haven't been down there. Yeah, that's between 7th and 8th and Cherry and Wabash. Uh, eventually, there will be a hotel. There, the Hilton Garden Inn will be connected. There's two parking garages, and then there'll be another, and it, it looks as if it's going to be a Marriott here at some point. Okay. And so the thought is, you know, you, you want to create an environment to where when you come here and park, you don't have to get out in the elements you walk from your parking place to your room or to the venue. And so that's kind of a, a selling point, if you will, of convention centers. So the entrance be on the Wabash Avenue side, or what can you tell uh, about There that? will be multiple entrances, the okay. main being there, yes. Right. Anything else in the image there that you want to point out to our viewers? Uh, well, just, you know, the sheer beauty of it. Uh, yeah. And I'm sure, you know, I, I felt this way. I, I think I'm a fair representation of, of Terre Haute folk, but uh, it's big, you know, <laughs> it, it, when, when you drive through there, you think, wow, uh, and you know, really in the last, I mean, 10 years to now, you've had all this housing development, be it on Cherry or Wabash, you've done, uh, uh, you know, $64 million on ISU, building on ISU's campus, Health and Human Services, uh, a redo of Holman Center, now this investment, uh, you know, I, three to five years down the road, I would tell you Terre Haute will be better than it's ever been. Uh, you know, the offerings that are that that's are all downtown. Terre Haute. Yeah. That's right. Absolutely. So downtown's getting a, a big push. Uh, you know, it, it really, I, it's going to be a, a wonderful thing. We'll that's the uh, floor plan. Okay. Uh, uh, you know, that shows you the different configurations and, and that, um, so it's just kind of a, an overview of a, of a site plan. And as far as, oh, let's go back to that in a minute. My staff, so with regards to that, David, you know, uh, if you could share with us kind of what the vision was with regard to the floor plan and the usages that were thought about for the facility. Well, basically you want to be adaptive. So that means if you have, whether it's 100 people or capacity of 1,000, you know, you have the potential to serve multiple groups on the same day. Okay. And so the collapsible walls and those kind of things, uh, those are all those part, are part of it. Okay. Yeah. And, and, and who, who was, uh, I guess, instrumental in the design and, and the uh, construction of this project? Well, Nations Group is, is probably the one of the initial design, and they've done, wow. I don't know, probably close to 100 around uh, the country. Okay. Done a wonderful job. And so uh, the gentleman who heads that up is an ISU. He got his master's from ISU. Is that right? And so he kind of sought out this project because, you know, he's good at what he does. And and so that expertise, I'm happy that, that he kind of found us. That's good. Uh, and that's been, wow, that's probably been close to seven years ago. Okay. So there's been a lot of thought going in this over the years. Um, and yet some of these things are fundamental to the, you know, to the convention center trade per se. I mean, you know, you want to have a, a beautiful, well-lit room with all the technology adaptable walls so you can scale down to the proper size to make it look right. Uh, you know, this is an artist rendering, but... but uh, what is this of? Uh, this would be the main floor at full capacity. Okay. And so we hired a company called Spectra that will oversee operations. Operations will be paid for through the Fed food and beverage tax, uh, so there'll be no cost to the taxpayers uh, other than that 1% tax, which isn't on groceries. It's, you know... Uh, so I think it's fair. Um, it's kind of a usage tax as opposed to just an overall. Uh, you know, so the community can reap the benefits. Uh, you know, people are shocked to hear that tourism in Terre Haute's a $30 million industry. I mean, pre-COVID, yeah. it was a $30 million industry. And you know, you can do the math. You collect $2.5 million at 8%. That shows you. So, it, you know... A lot of my friends, I, I can remember when I took this job, they thought I'd lost my mind, Terre Haute and Tourism. And yet, you know, mm -hmm. we, we really have a good brand here. And I would tell you, it's, it's mainly the people involved. We, we've done it with the people involved. It's nice to see now that we're investing in ourselves and creating the venues that then will, will supplement that, all the wonderful people here that work their tails off on all these weekends. Uh, so, you know, it really is a great thing to kind of see this come full circle. 
uh, in 26 years. What's the capacity for this room? 1,000. 1,000. Mm -hmm. Wow. So have we got any of those booked yet? Have we, have we got we, your surprise we birthday actually, party? Well, we have that? now, but we've had <laughs> interest, and we're, you know, we're keeping track of that. Kind of the full set scale solicitation is kind of starting now. We just hired a GM uh, to run it, uh, a young lady that, that uh, started helped start one in Utah. She was born in Carbondale, helped start one in Utah, and now has been running the St. Charles, Missouri, which I'm familiar with. Uh, really an impressive young lady. I, I think her professionalism and great slides you brought with you today and then what do we got yeah and last but not least and probably and we have a separate company and you'll forgive me the name escapes me at the moment but uh, we have a company that's charged with the responsibility of putting together the Larry Bird Museum uh, you know we've all been a fan, fan of Larry's for a long time right. since the late 70s and uh, all the things he has uh, there'll be some interactive elements along with you know just the static displays but uh, that's probably something that's fairly unique to a convention center. Uh, you know, not a lot kind of have an attraction within. And mm -hmm. so I think that'll be neat that, uh, you know, when people come here, you know, Indiana and basketball are synonymous terms. Absolutely. And uh, so the fact that this reflects that, I think, will speak well for all of us. And where will that be situated in the building? That's going to kind of be on the east side as you enter the main building. Uh, uh, boy, I, I want to say 11,000 square feet, okay. if memory serves. Uh, so probably the one worry I have is, you know, we're going to have so much neat stuff in there, it's going to be displayed properly, and that's where this company comes in. That They've done a number of very impressive facilities around the country. And and so, you know, again, I, I expect great things from them. And would that be, a, that be visible then? From, from the frontage of the building on Wabash? Uh, I believe it's going to be visible on the second floor. You'll, okay. you'll see a part of it on the second floor that will be glass. Uh, signage, we're still kind of hashing that out, whether it will be sponsored. But that museum will be its own 501c3. So that will kind of take on a life okay. of its own separate from the convention center offerings. It will have its own board of overseers, all that kind of thing. And, uh, you know, really be its own entity within... The convention center. So how's the project progressing from your perspective? Uh, wonderful. We actually have a, a capital improvement board meeting tomorrow morning, but uh, right now we're a month ahead of schedule, which never, never happens No. Uh, on any construction project. Uh, but uh, Garmung's done a great job. They're, they're great communicators. They're well prepared every month when, when we have our meetings, uh, you know, and, and you know, these past 14 months or so, they've been Zoom. Uh, but, I, you know, I know a number of the public and the media uh, have sat in, and mm -hmm. those prompt questions are, or, uh, you know. it. So I, I think it's a good part of the process. Also, the Children's Museum has a camera that Nations Group funded that you can go online and see the progress of the of the construction Is project. That right? Really a neat, you know, if you haven't seen that, you can do that from the comfort of your own home. Do you know what how people could access that offhand? Uh, go to the Children's Museum website okay. and, uh, yeah, they'll find it from there. Very good. So what is the estimated time to complete? Next April. Okay. Yeah, it's be completed about a year from now. Very so, good. So is there a anticipated opening ribbon cutting grand opening we haven't sort? set a date yet okay um but that will probably be prior to april uh, you know we want to hit the ground running and so you know we've hired this gm now she'll go about finding people training them uh it's not as easy as it looks you know i mean it uh the training's extensive i mean there we want to have it to be where it's first class and and everybody's on the same page and that was probably the two things I was particularly impressed with this young lady that we hired was how dedicated she seemed to be to that portion of it. Uh, but then she also had questions about, you know, different selling points that, in, for example, St. Charles, Missouri has a ionization and, and a particular uh, heating and cooling system that ensures less germs. I've asked that they look into that. 
Okay. Uh, you know, if it's $3 million, it might not be as good of an idea as it's 300000 or something. But, uh, but you know, all those things, again, you come back, they're selling points for the venue. Sure. And right now, you know, cleanliness and, and those kind of things are are at a heightened awareness that we've never experienced. So, so you, does your office have a presence in that facility? No, we will be, we'll basically be kind of a co-sales team and an enhancer, if you will. Okay. Um, so Spectre will oversee it. Um, but no, we'll keep our offices where they are. Um, at some point, we had talked about that, and yet, you know, our role is to help solicit for groups to come there. I don't know that we need to be under the same roof for that. So. You've got to be real excited about that project and... No, the opportunities absolutely. that opened up for so many different things. Absolutely. You know, and, and a good example of that, uh, for years, you know, Bill and Joyce Berdine ran Holly in South. Uh, he was a founding board member as well, Bill. Uh, and so for 33 years, we had Holly in South, which was a 450-seat room with the adaptable walls and all that. And they ran at a 70% occupancy rate. Uh, I have no doubts that we won't do the same thing here. That's great. Yeah. So, so what other things are on the horizon that you could share with us without breaching any confidences? Wow. Well, um, you know, beyond things like we just had a 17-team track invitational to ISU this past weekend. We have Rose's Conference with 10 teams coming in the end of the month. Uh, about 1,000, 1,200 kids at a soccer tournament uh, in two weeks. Um, uh, boy, we have a lot of bids out from... Uh, from a state fire convention, uh, Terre Haute Firefighters will spearhead that effort along with my office uh, and the mayor. And uh, and cross country, we boy, we've got some big ones on the hook there. I, I hope all those pan out. And sadly, I can't mention those, but some are some are state, some are national, and uh, really high profile races that would mean a lot to this community. So. Well, we, we've never been able to persuade you to run for public office, but uh, you have, since a, you were a young man, which you are no longer anymore, but <laughs> you've always been a tremendous cheerleader for Terre Haute and Eagle County, and uh, you, you continue to do that to this day, and I can't think anybody better to be in the position than yourself because of your passion for what you do and, and your compassion and passion for, for Eagle County and Terre Haute. So, uh, that goes to you and your entire family, to say the least. So, um, what you personally, what are what are your plans moving forward? Continue to do what you're doing, sell Terre Haute? Yeah, um, yeah. I don't I don't look to change. I you know I really I I've taken great pride in in my 25 plus years there. I want to see a couple of these big projects completed, and uh, and you know at that point. Few years down the road, it'll be time for a, a younger person to come in and and you know put their talent and passion into this thing. But uh, it you know it, it's really a, a neat story in that I I got lucky. I mean I, I as I said I was a kid that loved sports and so the fact that you know half of what I do is is helping organize and enhancing sporting events it's really a pretty cool thing and and so you know. If I can make my community better, then that's just a bonus. So, well, let me know when you and Jamie are on the tennis court. I want to come out and cheer her on. <laughs> we we got to rub it in as best we can. But we really appreciate you being with us. Any last words for our viewers? You know, I would tell you going forward. Uh, you know, folks, the the young people in this community, they need to to give back a little and volunteer for different activities. Get, become involved. Uh, you know, this is really a wonderful community, and I. I don't hear it much anymore, but, you know, used to when we were young, they, people would say, oh, there's nothing to do in Terre Haute. You know, there are so many things to do here and so many wonderful offerings that, that really, I, I I hope we put that to bed. But uh, Thank you. that's probably something that, you know, the through my career, the people have sustained this. The groups that are in these activities because they love them, that's what makes the difference. Well, you sure made a difference, and we appreciate you being here. We appreciate all that you've done to make Terre Haute and Beagle County a better place for all of us, and and uh, keep doing the great job you've been doing. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, Joe. All right. David Patterson, uh, we appreciate him being here, and we appreciate him bringing along those uh, beautiful uh, 
video or viewer boards there for us to share with our viewers tonight. It uh, definitely helps to, if you haven't been down down to see that, uh, stop down and see it. And uh, we're moving on with our next guest here. Well, who is this young lady who's joining us? <laughs> we definitely know they see you around on TV. Yes, they have, I'm sure. Tell our viewers who you are in case they, they have not chan turned that channel over to Channel 2. Well... My name is Taylor Johnson. I'm actually now the former weekend anchor um, huh. at WTW. My last day was on Saturday, so I'm in transition right now. Is that right? Yes. Well, Taylor, we uh, are both happy for you and sad that that news has been conveyed, but uh, why don't you tell our viewers a little about your background? Yes. Well, I'm originally from Maryland, so I'm an East Coaster. Um, born okay. in D.C. and raised in Prince George's County, Maryland, so right outside of D.C., so... Um, elementary, middle, high school, college, all in the same county. Wow. Um, and then from there, I, well, I studied journalism. Let me go back to that. And then from there, I worked in downtown D.C. for a year and a half at a neuroscience nonprofit um, as a digital communications associate, so social media, things like that. And then um, journalism was my true passion, so I decided to go back on that path. And so I moved to Lynchburg, Virginia. I was there for about a year and a half, and then Terre Haute came calling, and that's how I ended up here. So you had a desire to pursue journalism as a very young lady, is that correct? Yes, yes. Maybe back in your elementary years, is that correct? That is very true. So what was the what was it that spurred your interest that young? The weather. It started with the weather. Um, it seems to be a recurring <laughs> thing. <laughs> you hear that? It's just so interesting. Is you that know? right? Yeah, and I remember um, the meteorologist there, and he's still the chief meteorologist um, at the CBS affiliate in D.C. His name is Topper Shutt, and I used to watch him every evening. Um, I grew up in my great-grandparents' home, so we would have dinner every night at a set time. The news was on at 6, and Topper Shutt was on there, and I would just watch him. You know, um, but you didn't play in the circus band though, like Kevin Orpert though, did you? Just to be clear about that. I didn't. Um, and so I just always had interest in news and TV. It just always was appealing to me. And we had a video camera um, growing up. So, Is that right? Yeah, well, my sister, my sister and I are seven years apart. She was born in 2000. And so my great-grandmother would film my sister, you know, her being a baby. And I was always throwing myself in front of the camera. You know, just... Have we got any of that footage that we can show our viewers? No, or not? I don't know what happened to We might tapes. be able to pull some of that and see if we can get David <laughs> to play it in the mu museum. As well. that might be great. Be, I, yeah, could, we, I could become a Terre Haute legend, too. Absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, so I kind of started with that. Okay. And then, um, so I used to write when I was younger, short stories, chapter books, plays. So I always enjoyed writing. Kind of a lost art, isn't it? It is. It's becoming so, um, but people are blogging nowadays, and that was something that I got into later. Um, but once I got to middle school, we had morning announcements, and so I would read off the front page of the Washington Post. Is that and right? then another person would read the weather, and another person would read the lunch menu. And so that was kind of my first broadcast experience. <laughs> and then when I got to high school, I did the newspaper, and that was a lot of fun. Um, so I kind of put my hands in the different mediums that are out there. And then college, I went to University of Maryland. Go Terps. I know this is Sycamore Maryland <laughs> Terrapins, is that right? <laughs> yes. And what is a Terrapin? A Terrapin is a turtle. Okay. Yes, uh, a fierce turtle. His name, is, fierce. his name is Testudo. Hence, fear the turtles. Yes, All fear right. the turtle. All right. And I take great pride in my school. Um, great journalism program there. Connie Chung came from there. Right. Um, and actually, Maury Povich, who she's married to, his father was a sports journalist, and they named our sports center after his father, Shirley. And so now they have these symposiums every now and then, and sometimes Morty comes, and he um, will moderate them. And I ran into him in the hallway one day, and it was so cool. <laughs> um, but, yes, I studied journalism there, and I volunteered at the campus television station. But most of my internships were in magazines. I had an interest in entertainment and, like, lifestyle. So um, my first internship was with the entertainment magazine, and then I was with the DC Lifestyle Magazine and got to go to like the little upscale events. And I don't know if you've ever seen the movie The Devil Wears Prada, but it was kind of like. <laughs> not recently. Not recently. Not in the last you know, it, 60 they days. They reminded me so. of that because like the main character, Anne Hathaway, she was interning for this Vogue like, um, okay. you know, magazine where, you know, they're doing these upscale um, photo shoots and stuff and you have to transport all this expensive stuff. So. 
my manager at the time, she had given me like thousands of dollars of jewelry to transport back to the jewelry store. And I had to get on the Metro to take it. And I just remember being so nervous because I'm like, oh my gosh, like I hope I don't lose it or somebody robs me or something like that. I got it there. Um, but that was a really cool experience. <laughs> yeah, but toward the end of my time in college, I took a class my last semester about how media was changing. You know, newspaper is kind of dying off and it was turning into digital, social, things like that. And I was really into um, blogging and things online. And so I thought that maybe social media was the way I wanted to go. So I didn't have a newsreel um, prepared to go into a newsroom. So I decided to go the digital route and so I started working at the neuroscience nonprofit. And it's actually fun. It was kind of like a corporate America experience. So, you know, I take the, the metro downtown and go to Starbucks and get my coffee and, you know, put flat down the street. You know. um, and it was fun. So how long did you do that? I did that from January 2016 till around September 2017. And so were you, you were blogging during this time as well? Yes. So I had my own. and So um, now, just so we're clear, I mean, I'm uh -huh. throwing around some terms here. <laughs> <laughs> we're talking about blogging, not vlogging, right? Right, blogging. So, so, so vlogging is like the, the video version, and that's actually a lot of work. But vlogging is the video, the V. Yes. Vlogging. Okay. So like folks on YouTube are like I got explain this to our viewers, you know, they're yes. not quite as <laughs> adapt with social media as I am. You know, so, <laughs> so, yeah, so yeah. vlogging is kind of like, you know, reading an online newspaper of sorts. So I had my own, and then I also worked with um, a University of Maryland alum. Her name is Joy Marie McKenzie, and she was actually working with ABC News for a while during that time. And it was called the Fab Empire. And so basically my job was to go to all the cool events and review them. So I could go, to, I went to concerts and like premieres for TV shows and movies. Mm -hmm. It was a blast. And <laughs> Vicky knows I'm a big fan <laughs> of the Real Housewives. And so they had a Real Housewives <laughs> premiere and I got to go to the party and like meet them. It was a lot of fun. And then I just write about it. You know, um, you're, you're quite a name dropper. You know <laughs> 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 Has anybody else told you that? Or? It makes for a really cool story. Okay, that's fine. I mean, that's good. I just dropping her right left. I didn't expect to get more of that from Dave Patterson. <laughs> <laughs> he was you know, too busy talking about himself to drop any of that. It was fun, you know, and I enjoyed it. And it, it was a way to help me to continue to build upon my skills, even though that wasn't what I was doing in my day job. I see. Um, but then after a while, you know, it just, the job got really boring. I felt unfulfilled. And so I just started looking around. But the key was, and I didn't know this back then, was that moving away was what I was going to need to do in order to make progress in journalism. Um, because D.C. is a very large market. And so each news market is ranked. And the biggest, of course, is number one, New York City. And the lowest is like 200 and something. So D.C. is like market six or seven so top ten that's big they're they weren't going to take you know little me with little snow experience um so i was just putting out applications here and there and somehow i ended up hearing back from lynchburg virginia which i had never heard of before um and they said that they had an opening for a digital content producer so i would go in doing the web and social media because that's the skills that i had at the time okay um and that was just a way to get my foot in the door. And I learned a lot in that position. Um, Lynchburg, it's funny when I came to Terre Haute and I told people where I'm from, they're like, oh, it must be a culture shock for you coming here, you know, from living outside a big city. But Lynchburg was, I would say Terre Haute actually has a lot more going on than Lynchburg. Is that right? The biggest thing about Lynchburg is Liberty University. Okay. Um, and, yeah. <laughs> but it wasn't a lot socially going on. That'll be for another show. That yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and because Liberty was there, you know, Christian conservative school, everything closed down early. So, mm -hmm. you know, it wasn't much going out and doing things. So Terre Haute definitely was a lot more fun for me compared to Lynchburg. Right. Um, but, you know, I learned a lot being in a newsroom, learned how it functioned. And then I also used it as an opportunity to leverage myself or try to leverage myself to become a reporter. And so when I was off, I would make my own reel. So I would follow the reporters around, basically like an intern of sorts, and just do mock stories um, or mock live shots. So I remember 
there was a tornado there in 2018, like huge damage everywhere. And I just, you know, use it as an opportunity to go out and say, hey, you know, we just saw this tornado here. That's blah, neat. Blah. Anybody suggested that to you or just come up on your own? Well, that's encouraged um, okay. across the board. You have to have a real, and that's basically like your resume, um, so that news directors can see how you are on camera, how you can tell a story, things like that. Um, so that so were you ever on air in Lynchburg? I was not. Okay. I wanted to be, um, but it didn't work out that way. And so once I realized that, I felt like back then I did so well in digital that that's kind of where they saw me. And I didn't want to do that forever. So, um, you know, once I kind of figured that that was going to be the path there, I just started putting out my applications. And I mean, I applied to so many places. I put out over 100 applications and maybe talk to three news directors. And um, it's a very, it can get discouraging. It can get very discouraging. Um, and especially going through a time where, you know, I wanted to be a reporter there and it wasn't working now. I already kind of had that, you know, struggle that I was dealing with. And on top of, you know, trying to be resilient and keep pushing forward, because you, you don't see what the future has ahead, you know, but in that moment, it just, it, it didn't feel good. But I kept pushing. Well, who down at WTOWO had their wits about them to get a hold of you? Oh, I know. man. So <laughs> the good thing about social media is that there are so many ways for you to connect with people. And there is a young lady named Kamara Daughtry, and she started this group called Digital Career Opportunities, which was filled with reporters, news directors, general managers, and people could just drop their reels in there. And so that's what I did. I said, you know, my name is Taylor Johnson. I'm looking for a job. And one day I got a message on Facebook from my news director and he said he introduced himself and he said he had an opening in Terre Haute, Indiana. And so I was like, oh well let me Google, you know, Terre Haute, Indiana. He said, Oh, I've been there several times. <laughs> <laughs> and I saw it and at first I was like, mm, I don't know about that because I wanted to get back to a metropolitan area. Because that's what I was used to. And Terre Haute didn't look like that's what it was. But it did have its benefits because another thing about Lunchburg, it was far from larger city. So at least, you know, Terre Haute's an hour from Indianapolis. If I wanted to go there or if I wanted to fly somewhere, it wouldn't take so long. In Lynchburg, I had to drive two hours to North Carolina to catch a flight on, to go on vacation, you know. But um, I talked to him, and the first time I talked to him, I was like, I don't know about this because pay is very low. And going from D.C. to Lynchburg was already um, a pay cut for me, a pretty big one. Um, so I kind of like put them to the side for a little bit because I was talking to a news director in Toledo, one in Columbia, South Carolina. Um, Toledo, they decided that they wanted to go in a different direction because I didn't have enough, enough experience using a camera. Um, and I have my thoughts about that. And then Columbia, the news director there, he was kind of moving his feet, you know, a little too slow. And I was ready to leave Lynchburg. So I reached back out to my news director um, and I asked him if they had any openings and he said that they did. We talked on the phone, he gave me the job, I signed the contract, and um, this was all within like two days. So it happened wow. really fast. Yes, it did. And so when I was in Lynchburg, um, I had my own apartment and everything it was my first time, you know, living on my own, having my own stuff. And Terre Haute was 10 hours from where I was from. So I sold everything <laughs> in that apartment, put it all on Facebook Marketplace, and I just left with my clothes. And um, my grandmother drove with me out here. And actually, when we came, um, we were talking to, to Dave before, it was Special Olympics that weekend. And so we had checked into the Home 2 um, hotel, and her flight ended up getting canceled. So we had to do it another night. And when I went to go book it again, like, almost all the rooms were gone because everyone was here for Special Olympics. So I remember that. Um, so when was that that you made your initial trip to Terre Haute? I came to Terre Haute in June of 2019. And you'd never been here before? No. So what were your initial impressions of Terre Haute? I thought that Terre Haute was nice. I remember when we first got here, my grandmother and I, we went down Ohio Boulevard, and she was like, oh, this is so lovely. Like, she just <laughs> loved it. Um, but Terre Haute, it was, like I said, it was better to me than Lynchburg. The downtown was a little bit more developed. It had more places to eat, um, you know, and people were very friendly around here. So, I mean, I thought it was great. So when you landed up at the news station, what were your responsibilities at that time? So at that time, I was a reporter, um, or MMJ, which is short for Multimedia Journalist, which means we're a one-man band, 
and I have to definitely shout out my college for training me for that. So whenever I go out and people are like, oh, you don't have a cameraman? No, we don't. <laughs> um, we are trained to do everything. We shoot, we write, we edit, we do the interviews. And so that's what my job was. And I did that for about six months. And then I started filling in on the anchor desk on the weekends because our weekend anchor at the time had been promoted. So I decided to, or asked to help out in that way. And then I did that for another six months. And then they gave me the position permanently. And then I did that from June of last year up until Saturday. What was the biggest difference from being a reporter to being an anchor? Well, being an anchor, my my version of being an anchor, it was a challenge because on the weekend, there's no management, there's no producer. So I had to produce the show um, the day before. So Fridays, we would have meetings and basically curate the content that we're going to have over the weekend. So giving reporters their assignments. So it was kind of like a mini news director of sorts. Um, so not only did I have to produce it, but I had to run into the restroom and, you know, get myself together and then run out and anchor and run the teleprompter myself. Um, we have like a foot pedal kind of like in a car, like when you're pressing on the gas, kind of like that, it, you know, run the prompter and just listen to the scanner. It's a, it was a lot going on. Yeah, it's kind of probably like doing a chat with a chair. You guys know it all. <laughs> <laughs> Although, I you did work, a great job too. well, I appreciate that. <laughs> uh, of course, I have a lot of help. But, uh, you know, one thing, and I'm watching the wonderful job you do, I, I haven't noticed a, a blazer that you wear quite like this, so <laughs> might need to work that in, and, and maybe that would be the thing that could really put you over the top. I've been trying to find my, um, what do you call that, your signature. Yeah, your signature. And I wear glasses, and I thought about making, like, glasses my signature because I've always worn purple eyeglasses because purple is my favorite color. Okay. But I don't like how glasses look on the air. So then I tried, well, maybe I could do brooches. But then I have an agent, and she's like, it's too flashy. So I'm still trying to figure out, you know, what my thing will be. I think I need to talk to that agent. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get that agent straightened out. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm still working on it. And I'm still pretty young in the journalism business. So I think I have some, some time to decide. What that You've is. done a tremendous job. And, and uh, so let's talk about some of the... the Things you've done here while you've been uh, in Terre Haute and Beagle County, and, and uh, what uh, things you might be able to share with our viewers about the future for yourself. Well, I've done a lot here, and I'm really grateful to my management at WTWO for allowing me to really just get put my hands in different pots and become very skilled. It really helped me really to market myself um, in my most recent job search. And one of the best things that I enjoyed was getting to fill in on the weather wall. That was a lot of fun. Um, Jesse Walker was a great coach and a great teacher. And it was really exciting. And it kind of bit me a little bit that I'm, you know, considering taking that route in meteorology. I mean, you know, that was my original interest right. as a little kid. Um, so it was kind of like a full circle moment. But just doing that, it felt natural, you know, um, I did it, the first time that I did it, it just happened, um, we were in between morning meteorologists, and so we had a guy from Evansville who was freelancing for us, and he would do the morning show remotely, but then we didn't have a noon meteorologist, and so I had to fill in for a few days um, for Dana, and so they were like, oh, by the way, you got to do the weather too, and so I was like, okay, and I wasn't required to get on the wall, but I was like, you know what, I mean... If I can do, you know, if I can do it, I'll just go ahead and give it a try. And sure. so the first couple of days were a little rough. Um, but then I learned the trick is just to go to the next slide while you're still talking about the previous slide because I would have, like, awkward pauses. And pausing on TV is just not good. No. <laughs> <laughs> so I learned how to make it work. And so they let me do it a handful of times. And that's something that helped me to stand out um, for news directors that I talked So you didn't to. have a weather wall back in the day with, when you were a young girl with those video cameras? No, no I did not. Okay. I was not talking about the weather. <laughs> <laughs> so is, is, a, is meteorology in your future then? I I would say so. Um, I've been looking at a meteorology program, Mississippi State, and that's where a lot of uh, meteorologists come from. Excuse me. So I've been looking into that. One thing about my career path that I've noticed is I just have no idea where it's going to take me. Um, but I'm glad to know that I can do just about everything. You know, I can produce, 
I can write, I can edit, I can anchor, I can fill in the weather, you know, jack of Jane of all trades, yes. which has been cool. Um, another thing that Terre Haute allowed me to do or kind of dropped in my lap was covering the federal execution. That was um, a very interesting experience. And initially, I didn't want to do it. You know, I'm like, I don't want to you know, sit there and watch someone die. But I went. I was out there the very first day that they started back up. And I think the guy's name was Daniel Lewis Lee, who they were executing. And, you know, was so many people out there. Fox News was out there. Um, I don't know if like the Associated Press. Just, you know, a big deal. And I thought that it was just really, I, I realized the gravity of what was happening in my community, you know, this place where I live. And so as I, they were coming and going, because it was so many of them. And Dana Winkleplek is the MVP because she watched almost all of them. You know, I, I couldn't do that, you know, but she, um, yeah, so she did most of them. And so the final two, I was left up to me. And then um, Nicole Christine did the very last one. And I had decided to do it because of the fact that like I had mentioned, it was something that was impacting our community. The federal prison is here. We don't see it often. Like I had never seen it until the very first execution. And I was like, whoa, you know, it's huge. It's kind of creepy too. Yeah. Um, but it was my responsibility and my duty as a journalist to let people know what was happening in their community. And this was happening in the community. So I swallowed my pride. Um, I talked to my news director about it and he gave me a pep talk. And um, I signed up for it. And I would say that mine was probably the easiest out of everyone because the family didn't want to speak. Um, so I didn't really have to deal with too many emotions from other people. Mm -hmm. um, but the folks who were there with me, the other media witnesses, um, the Tribune Star, Channel 10, some AP reporters, they had all done it before. So I was the only person who was new to it. And they were very encouraging. Um, you know, if you have any questions, if you need any help, you know, let us know. So we were kind of all in it together. Um, we sat in the waiting room for a while because it had gotten pushed back due to some Supreme Court business going. You know, they were trying to delay it. And it was around maybe 11. It was supposed to happen at 6. We didn't leave out of the media room until 11. We get in this van. We had to leave our phones and everything. Um, they had notepads and a pen for us in the execution chamber. So we didn't take anything. And so we get on the van, went over to the prison. And then we had to go through security, kind of like the airport, you know, take off your shoes and everything. Um, and as we were getting closer, you know, I had to drop down my head. I started praying, you know, Lord, see me through this because I just didn't know what to expect. Um, and before I went, I talked to Dana and she walked me through what it looked like. And so everything that she described, it basically kind of happened in that way. The only unpredictable part was the person who was being executed. How are they going to respond to it? Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, we walked in there. And as soon as we walked in, the blinds lifted up and you see the person in there, you know, on the gurney. And it's a couple of guys with the prison. They're in their suits and, you know, they're just standing there. And um, they asked the guy if he had any last words. He didn't have any. His family was in there, though, because he was like kind of looking over to the side. And once they um, started injecting him, you could hear them like, you know, chanting that they loved him and things like that. Um, and we just had to be very, um, I'm trying to think, we had to really just pay attention to what was happening because we didn't have anything with us. So having to take notes, pay attention to the time, but then pay attention to what he was doing, pay attention to what was happening in the next room, and then all trying to be reserved with their own emotions as well. It was a lot to experience. But I will say that it definitely made me a stronger journalist. I feel like if I can do that, I can cover anything now. Um, and I'm glad that I was able to do it, as crazy as that sounds, you know. Well, thanks for sharing that story with us. You know, yeah. as glamorous as you always appear on TV, <laughs> you're, you are, you, you've you been through a lot, and, and uh, your your determination and perseverance is, is admirable. And for our viewers out there and the young uh, ladies in particular that are aspiring to do what you do, what words of encouragement would you give them? I would definitely tell them to make sure that this field that you want to go into is what you truly want to do from your heart. It's a service position because you do not, in the beginning, you will not get paid much. And it looks glamorous, but that's only a portion of 
I mean, when you're a reporter, you're only on TV for maybe about 30 seconds. And then if you're an anchor, maybe like 15 or 20. The rest of it is serving the community. It's being able to just really get down into just the nitty gritty of things. So you definitely want to have a servant's heart. You want to be kind to people and also be kind to yourself. Mental health and self-care in this business is very important. I've been stressed. I've been on the borderline of just like, you know, wanting to give up because it's hard work. But the reward is, it, it's amazing. So where or will our viewers be able to check you out then here in the coming months? Yes, well, I'm headed to Kansas City, Missouri, which is very exciting. Never been there either, so <laughs> <laughs> that'll be an adventure. Um, and it'll be live streamed, so you'll be able to watch me there. Unfortunately, WTWO didn't have streaming, so you would have to watch live. Okay. Um, but, but yeah, that's where I'm headed next. I'm going to be a morning reporter. So I don't have to be working on the weekends anymore, which I'm very excited about. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Get the weekends back. So, as talented as you are, you, you realize you're going to be uh, you're going to be a national you're going to be on national news one of these days and be the lead anchor on a national story. So I'm wondering if we're going to be able to get you to come back to chat with the chair when you're really big time at that time. Well, I received that. I, I really received that from my life. Um, so yeah, I mean, absolutely. Now, I was talking to my grandmother earlier. She was like, you know, you should probably get yourself a house in Terre Haute, you know, and just like make that your second home. Absolutely, like, we'd love hmm, it too. It's a good idea. Well, you are extremely talented and, and hardworking and resilient and determined, and uh, the future is uh, upward trajectory for you. So Thank you're you. a rising star, and it's going to be excited to follow your career. We've enjoyed having you here in Terre Haute, Beagle County, and as I said, we're sorry to see you go, but it's great for your future. And again, uh, it's going to be national anchor. I, I'm calling it right now. So, uh, now when I get my Emmy, I'm going to say thank you, Joe. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> One last word for our viewers. Um, I just want to thank everyone who has supported me, supported WCWO. Um, everyone down there just works so hard to keep everyone informed. It's around the clock. You know, it never ends. We're never off, honestly. Um, and just the outpouring of support that I've received you know, from, from you and even from Dave. We've, I've interviewed him a couple of times, and anytime I've called him, he's always called me back. And so, you know, it's the Wabash Valley has been very good to me, and um, I'm really going to miss it here. It's a it's a, a great place, honestly. Well, I know Miss Vicky's going to miss you as well. So. I know. I told her I'm going to pack her up and take her with me. <laughs> well, we can't lose you both. So. <laughs> we really appreciate you being with us, yeah. and uh, it's been a delight, and we we really glad you came and shared those stories with us. And Dave Patterson, thank you as well. This has been another delightful chat with the chair. So for our next one. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.